My dear alert physics students, I give to you a table. Now imagine we're in class and we have the table in front of everybody, a table of width W and depth D. Okay. So imagine this table of width W and depth D is in front of us in the classroom. Imagine we're actually together. How nice that would be. But then suppose that I have three of you independently come up and use this meter stick to measure the width of that and depth of that table. So I call up student A. I call up somebody and I say, student A, measure width and depth of the table with this stick now. Okay, And she does so. And so we have width and we have depth. And the first student, student A, gives me these numbers right here. 125.35, this is centimeters. All measurements in centimeters. Centimeter is what fraction of a meter? Yes, one one hundredth. So these are all in centimeters. And the same student, student A, gives me for the depth for D, she gives me 57.65 also measured in centimeters. Perfectly fine. Okay, and then I call up, I, we all applaud student A, a student A goes back down, sits down at uh, her desk, and student B comes up, and I ask her the same thing. I say, will you please measure the width and depth of this desk with this meter stick and write down your answers for me. She does the same thing, measures width and depth in centimeters, and comes back with 126 and 57. Point one. Now notice something here. It's different. Student B gives me a slightly different range, a slightly different set of numbers than student A did. Using the same meter stick, facing the same table. Now I have actually done this when we're all together in a three-dimensional way. All right, I have actually done this with students and they don't give me the same numbers every time. Different students measure different numbers. This is why in lab, it's often good to measure a single quantity multiple times with multiple partners because the idea, of course, is to um, make several measurements and take the average because you don't know which one of these is right. Your best shot is to find the average of those numbers, right? So that's what you typically do when you're measuring things in lab and elsewhere. So let's say uh, student, we all applaud student B. Yay, student B, she sits down, student C comes up, and I ask her the same thing. I say, dear student C, will you measure the width and depth of this table and tell me what you get? Write it on a sheet of paper, and she gets the same number here, 126, but here she gets 58 centimeters. Maybe they're nervous being in front of the classroom at all, you know, can be nerve wracking. Uh, but they get different numbers, and so maybe they move their stick a little bit. Maybe they didn't, uh, you know, uh, set it right up at the square at the table. But these are the numbers we have. So I've asked three students. These are the numbers we have. And so what do we do? Well, we, to find out the width and depth, the best thing we do, as I've already indicated, is what? Yes, you take an average of those numbers. So let's do that. Take an average of the three numbers for the width. We take an average of the three numbers for the depth. And we get 125. I think this is showing up well. Yes, it's showing up fine. 125.78333333 all the way past the horizon going on forever. Threes all the way forever, okay? Repeating, that's what the bar over the three means. Let's take the average for the depth for this dimension of the table. Uh, take an average of those and we get 57. And you can check this on your calculator at home and you'll get these numbers, I promise. 57.583. Three. All the way beyond the cosmic horizon. Threes all the way. Well, these are obviously, 
we have to round these, right? We have to uh, look at the significant figures that we have. The students provided us for the width column the least that we had, remember the rule from lecture uh, video 1-4a, remember the, 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 the point, the point is that you have to use in your final answer the smallest number of significant figures that you were given at the get-go of the problem. Therefore, we have five here. Student A gave me five significant figures, which is a little much, but that's okay. This five might not be well known, but that's what she gave me. So that's what I'm going with. 126 and 126 are both three. So we have to cut this down to three significant figures. So the answer to the width is not 125.78333. It is 126 centimeters. And I think, I pray that this will fit in the video. Yes, it fits down in the screen nicely. So that is the answer. It is 126. That is our classroom answer to the question, what's the width of the table? Got it? Right? Well, now we come to D. Same game. Uh, student A gave us four significant figures. Student B gave us three. And student C gave us two. So we have to round this to two significant figures because two is the minimum that we were given for this calculation, for the question, what is D? So we have to round this to two. So it rounds to 50 what? 50, say it out loud, there in your house. It rounds to 50, I heard it, yes, eight. That is the answer. That is the width, 126 centimeters. The depth is 58 centimeters. Okay. At this point in the lecture, I would say, are there any questions about that? If you have questions, come to class and we will talk about it during class period, our uh, class office hours thing, which by now you know about. Okay, so that should be pretty straightforward. But now suppose that my question originally had been completely different. Suppose I had asked you not for the width or the depth separately, but suppose I had asked you, let's see what's a good color here, what is the area of the table, which of course is the width times the depth. We want to know the area. Now notice, the width times the depth is a length times a length, so the area is going to be in units of centimeters squared, a centimeter times a centimeter. Right? Area, the area of this glass board, the area of a football field, any area is expressed in dimensions of length squared. Okay, and here we're using centimeters, so it's going to be centimeters squared. Okay. So what do you do? Well, you multiply the width times the depth, right? And there you got it. That's the answer to the area. But here comes the tricky business. There goes my stick. Do we, dear student, do we multiply 125.783333 times 57.583333 or do we multiply 126 by 58? Which width, which area, I mean, which width and which depth do we use to find the area? Does it matter? Let's find out. Okay. If we take 125.78, three repeating, times 57.583, three repeating, right? That's, um, wipe this clean, that's a little bit confusing, right? Width times depth. 
okay, we get this number here. Seven, two, four, three, point zero, oh, two, three, five, five centimeters squared. So if we take those numbers, those two really infinitely long numbers, and multiply those, this is what we get. Well, this is obviously nine, nine digits here, so we don't keep all of those. We need to round this off, right? To how many significant figures do we have to round this long, crazy looking number to get the right answer? Well, here's our input data. We have five, three, three significant figures, four, three, two significant figures. The one that has the minimum number of significant figures is this one here with two. So we have to round this down to two significant figures. When you do that, you get 7,200 centimeters squared. Okay. That, we're not done. So hold on. That is what we get when we multiply these two numbers, 125.783 times 57.583. That's the number we get. But my original question, you'll remember because you're all very alert, is which one of these sets of numbers do we use to find the area? Do we use this one or do we use 126? So this one, so we'll option A, or do we use option B? which would be 126 centimeters times 58 centimeters. And when we multiply those two together, we get 7,308 centimeters squared. So we get a different number this way. And the question is, again, how many significant figures do we have to round this to? Right, because this has four significant figures in it, but we can't keep four because there's only two as the minimum number given to us in the input. So this has to be rounded to 7,300 centimeters squared. So when we use the second set of numbers, these two, and multiply them together, we get a different number. So the question is, which one is right? They can't both be right, right? This is physics. They can't both be right. One of them's got to be right. Which one is it? Is it the one where we use the unrounded numbers or the one where we use the rounded numbers? The answer is this one is correct. 7,200 is the right answer. This method is wrong. 7,300 is not the right answer. Notice, this is a two-step problem. Okay. First thing we did was in order to find the area, right? If you think about this in terms of what's the area of the table, what's a two-step problem? First, you have to find W and D separately, and then you have to multiply them to get the area. But notice, the way that we did it for B, this way, we cut down the number of significant figures twice. We did it here, 126 and 58. Those were the cut numbers, where we already trimmed the significant figures down to 2 and 3. So this represents a trimmed number, 126 and 58. Then we trimmed it again here. You don't do that. What you do when you have a multiple step problem, and listen to me here because this is the clip and save. I'm not going to write it out in words, okay? I'm going to say it and I want you to copy it in your notes and I want you to meditate on it as you sleep tonight. Okay? When you have a multi-step problem, 
you carry all significant figure, all decimal places through all the way to the end. You cut for significant figures only once, and that's at the end of the problem. So even though these numbers, these digits are not significant, the 783333, three, 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 the 5833, those are not significant figures and we know that, we don't cut them until we multiply those numbers together as they are and then we do one cut at the end. Multi-step problem, I'll say it again because I want you to meditate on it. When you have a multi-step problem, you only cut significant figures at the end. There is a single cut at the end, world without end, amen. That's how you do it, okay? A single cut and it's at the end. How about that for a noise, huh? So this is the only cut we make from that number to that number. From the 7243.02355 to the 7200, it's the only cut that we make the whole time. Okay, that's how you do your problems. You don't cut until the end. And speaking of the end, we're about a minute overdue with this video, so I'm going to stop it and we're going to move on next time to a new topic. Scalars and vectors. So get ready.